On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don. I'm a consultant in life sciences, and I help companies manage complexity and increase performance. This week, my guest is Christina Varner. Christine is the National Life Science and Digital Health and Telemedicine Practice Leader for Newfront. She supports the risk management needs of biotech, medical device, pharmaceutical, diagnostic, digital health, and telemedicine companies from early stage on up. So with that, welcome, Christine. Thank you so much for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks a lot. And uh, so could you just tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, when you were announcing what I do, I was like, wow, do I really do all that? <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, a little about myself. Um, I'm actually someone who is very focused on fashion. My college degree, when I went to college, I majored in fashion merchandising. The intent was to become a fashion buyer, but I graduated during a recession and opportunities in fashion were tough to come by. So I had to pivot and I happened to be the daughter of a former now retired risk manager. And my father also was his own insurance agency owner in the latter part of his career. And what do we always say? You never want to do what your parents are doing. Right. And I thought my dad, you know, I thought it's the most boring career ever and there's no way I'm doing insurance. And then lo and behold, he said, hey, insurance, it's great opportunities for you. You want a challenge. You've always worked really hard. Why don't you consider, you know, coming and working with me for a while and see if you like it and maybe you want to take over my agency someday. So during the last five years of his career, I worked with him. I'll say right now, there's no way in hell that I would take over his agency. He literally worked seven days a week. And I thought there's no work-life balance there. Uh, but I really liked insurance. And so I pivoted to the retail brokerage side. Um, I came first to ABD Insurance. Um, we were, and I'll explain that more in a minute, but we were a uh, full-service brokerage primarily based in Silicon Valley. We were very well known in the West. Um, and I worked primarily with technology companies, which was really exciting at the time when I, when I joined was during the height of the market. I saw a lot of companies go bang and then boom and then died. And, you know, I saw it all, but over time that became less challenging for me. So I sought out some other opportunities. And then ABD approached me a few years later and said, we're looking to build a life science practice. Would you be interested in building it? We know you like to own something and you want a challenge. And I had no idea what life science even was. I never worked with life science companies, but I said, sure. And the rest is history. And I became very passionate about this space. Uh, and my clients are very passionate. So I just, I... I love it. So that's where I came to be today. And then in the last couple of years, I started to focus at digital health and telemedicine because a lot of um, our life science buyers started, some of them left life science and migrated over that side and they came back to us for insurance. And so we de decided to build a vertical around that as well. So that's uh, currently what I'm involved in. What's so interesting, though, I mean, I, there are a couple of things that I've lived through as well, right? Some really tough economic times, you know, in my career. I know whenever I first graduated from school, it's a similar kind of story. I mean, a drastic economic downturn essentially laid off all of the people that were, you know, working on, um, you know, anything having to do with defense spending and things like that. My, my very first degree was in laser physics, so most of us were going to wind up somewhere in defense. And uh, it redirected my career, which then put me back in healthcare. So a similar sort of um, parallel from that standpoint. But, uh, you know, then also a few years later, I found myself in this position of, 
um, somebody had said, well, hey, we need a quality leader. We're not going to hire somebody. Why don't you go do quality for a while? And uh, my dad's entire career was quality. And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> so, yes, I can understand several, several elements of your story as well directly. Yeah. Yes. So can you tell us just a little bit about, um, you know, I mean, you spent 18 years, um, you know, more or less if LinkedIn is correct. I found a few times that LinkedIn is not exactly, you know, spot on, but I mean, your, your career has kind of, you know, left you to this point in, inside of life sciences. And then what made you transition, you know, to new front? Great question. So actually new front sort of found me as we were kind of chatting earlier, um, in 2021, ABD Insurance uh, merged with New Front. I had never heard of New Front. Uh, so it was news to me. Uh, typically, we know who our competitors are, but turns out they really weren't a direct competitor of ours. We like to think of ourselves, the reason we merge is because it's bringing two different companies that, that really have a lot more strength together. Um, New Front uh, is very technology focused and very innovation driven and ABD was as well, but we spent most of our time really focused on our expertise. And I think that's what we're known for is having industry verticals and having subject matter experts um, in house and New Front legacy new front was really focused on innovation. And so now we're merging, we've merged the two together and it's been really exciting to have access to tools and to continue to create tools that really are a game changer in insurance because I think everyone knows that insurance is very slow to change. And, um, and we're, we're especially probably because of coming from Silicon Valley, we, really are focused on change. I always used to say when I wanted certain things to happen, I'd go, well, I could probably hire someone in high school to do this because in the Valley, that's a lot of what you see. It's just young people doing amazing things. And I thought, why in insurance can't we get this done differently? And so now what's so exciting is that new front uh, we're doing. And so it's, it's, uh, that's what, that's what's brought me here today. That is great. I mean, so can you tell me a little bit more about sort of what does it look like? What do products look like and things like that from New Front for life science companies? What, is, what does that look like? Because I, as I was researching it, I was like, I didn't know that this existed, to be honest. Oh. Yeah, so that's a great question. So I get asked all the time. If, sometimes people literally don't know what life science is. I can't believe that, but they don't. And then then if I say that I manage clinical trials, for example, insurance for clinical trials, I'm like, oh, there's insurance for clinical trials. And it's like a force because there's a lot of risk with clinical trials. And so that is obviously for our teams, probably the predominant exposure is the clinical trials. I would say about 90% of our life science clients are in active trials today. And that's generally all over the world. So very little recruitment is in the U.S. anymore. It's typically mostly overseas. So we spend a lot of time, a lot of time with clinical trials, and then I'll, and then a lot of the other coverages that that you probably already wear: workers' comp, cyber liability, um, all the property casualty coverages, cargo stock throughput, et cetera. I think the largest exposure for life science companies besides flooring clinical trials or clinical trials is their product liability um, because anything that results in bodily injury uh, because of their product or their trials, that's a huge exposure for these companies. So um, that's probably where we spend a lot of our time. But then beyond that, we are a full service brokerage. So, you know, if they need directors and officers liability, retirement services, employee benefits and such, we also have different teams that manage those. And most of our clients do have our foot in different uh, teams within our organization. So that's great to see as well. But generally speaking, that's where what we're doing for them. Um, and clinical trials, like I said, just is probably the, the biggest area for them. 
And how do you normally get engaged then? So is it normally the the company that is recruiting patients or the the actual company that's running the clinical trial? Oh, great question. Yeah, so both. So we do probably work mostly with the manufacturers or the sponsors of the trial, the manufacturers of the, the drug or the device. And then uh, we also have contract research, research organizations that are clients as well, the CROs that actually run trials on their behalf. Um, so we have a number of them as clients um, and they have different risks, but uh, they are closely associated, but, but different. Um, and different exposures. So I would say uh, that's that's primarily, yeah, I think though that we we I think we do we do this we work with sponsors predominantly because that's just more a uh, common place. CRO, as you may or may not know, there's been a lot of m and a, and so a lot of smaller CROs have rolled into larger ones. So there's not as many out in the in the marketplace as there used to be. There's not as much competition there, but um, so we're predominantly working with the sponsors to procure the insurance for them. That's interesting. And then the, um, if, if I were to think about the different phases of clinical trials, um, so are you involved only whenever they get to human clinical trials or do you, you, you know, you know, I'm assuming that that's primarily where your, where your involvement starts, but that, I mean, uh, again, I'm just trying to clarify in case anybody in the audience, I have a lot of people I know that are you know, running clinical trials and this may be new for them as well. Who knows? Right. And, and actually we work with both. We have a separate team called the Emerging Risk Unit, and that team actually does work with the much earlier stage venture backed companies that might be just be purely an R&D. They might be like working with only animals, like in a vivarium. They may just be dealing with no uh, human trials yet. So that we typically would be engaging with them at that stage. The Emerging Risk Unit is is trained to work with those um, companies. And as they grow um, and they do start with their phase one, two, three studies, then that's where we engage. Um, them at that point. So. Okay. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, that, that really helps to clarify it. Cause I think the, you know, the, again, I've, I've observed a lot of these and I would imagine there's somebody sitting around inside of the company saying, you know, Hey, we should have insurance for this. And I am not normally involved there. <laughs> I would imagine most of the, the legal, you know, team is, is controlling a lot of this in most, most cases. Yeah, and I think they cut, you know, it comes various ways, right? Some venture capitalists know, you know, we know well, and they'll say, hey, this is probably the point where you should start to engage with an insurance broker. They might be advising a client of theirs who then becomes a client of ours. We, we've done that many times. I, I actually remember pre-pandemic quite often going to a VC's office. That just seems so, such a long time we've been out. And we would sit in a room with a very early stage company and walking them through sort of next steps with insurance because it was so new for them. And they might say, and it usually, again, starts with a, a clinical trial. It's usually, oh, we're about to go into Australia. We don't know anything about Australia. Can you talk to us about how, how we can properly protect ourselves? But also it's obviously required in order to conduct a trial to have insurance. Um, I'm not sure that's obvious for everyone, but it, it's definitely a requirement. And so um, those those days don't happen anymore. Now everything's done over the phone or Zoom. But uh, I, I remember those days well. And the venture capitalists are usually the first that they reach out to. It's like, who's what broker do you know that that can help us? So it was great. And that that was going to be my next question. So if you are not venture backed. Um, you know, I guess, do you have anybody that involves that, that then involves your company? And then if so, how do they get, how do they get kind of tied in, uh, with new front? It's the same actually, um, Don, it's, it's just that there's an, uh, there's a team that we call the small business unit instead of the merging risk unit. It's a small business unit where they are working with companies that are not venture backed. Um, so I think. I think where we differentiate against very large sort of global brokers is that we are willing to work and incubate 
these companies along their trajectory. Um, we've had a, an immense amount of success over the years uh, working from companies from early stage all the way up until they go public and then become very large. And that's been really exciting to see. And not every broker wants to dedicate the resources to do that. And so we pretty much don't, you know, we we don't discriminate in that way. It's it's if you are life science, um, especially, um, we do want to work with you. And what are some of the big, biggest challenges that you face at New Front? Well, this I was thinking about this question and I was thinking to myself, this might sound cliche, but the, the biggest challenge really is change. Um, because since merging with New Front, it's been a very dramatic shift in terms of New Front is truly sort of a technology platform type company. And if you've worked with technology companies, you know that they tend to move very fast. They want to break things. They want to fail fast. All the sort of things you hear about in the Valley. And then insurance, we're like, no, you have to slow way down. So even though they were doing insurance before, they were heavily tech focused. We're more heavily insurance focused. And we are risk managers, so to speak, outsource risk managers for our clients. So change has been difficult. But what I keep telling my teams is we wanted this type of change. We, so we, we just have to sort of meet in the middle and remember that the outcome is ultimately going to be what we want, which is better tools, better ways of operating and doing business, because we do it very differently than a traditional brokerage. Um, and I think that's very difficult, but it's exciting in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, I mean, uh, as much as I'd like to move fast in life sciences as well, I mean, we, there's a lot of reassurance that we've got to have as well that we're not going to you know, hurt people along the way. So it's, uh, um, you know, I understand the technology side, but I also, I mean, we saw kind of the, a bad player in this with uh, Theranos, right, a couple of years ago. And, and so, um, you know, I think, I think everybody sort of worries again about, you know, that element of it. But at the same time, you know, you're right. It's, I, th I don't know that insurance and healthcare are all that far apart from each other because most people are skeptical and wanting to move slower inside of this industry as well. Yes, agree, agree. And where do you see some of the biggest opportunities are? I think um, it really is the technology and also technical expertise. So I think the opportunities at New Front to forge both of these together has really been huge. Um, I've actually never seen anything like it before. So. You know, one of the areas that, like I mentioned before, we focus heavily on clinical trials um, and we have a portal uh, that is electronic. It is proprietary that we developed many years ago and we've iterated over time. In fact, um, early this month, we came out with the latest version and most of our competitors do not have a platform like this. And what it affords our clients is the ability to go into a portal and be able to quickly, it's an interactive uh, country map. They can quickly discern what's required in a specific country for insurance. They can upload the documents in the portal and then they can get a quote in, enough, in usually 24 to 48 hours. Um, historically, all of that's done by email. It's like what's required in South Korea. Then you send them an email back and then you go back and forth. And when we've met with large, large life science companies, it's always been interesting to me for me to hear the risk manager. You think they're going to come in with a big pain point and like, oh, I mean, I don't know what it, you know, I can't think of one off the top of my head, but something much larger than clinical trials. Um, and they usually say, oh, the biggest problem I have is clinical trials. And why do you have the problem? Well, it's because everything lands on my desk and I don't know, I don't know anything about clinical trials and I don't want to have to deal with this all day long. So they want to see the portal. They want to understand how is this going to make my life easier? It's accessible 24 seven from anywhere in the world. That's important because clinical trial people, personnel are all over the world. They are usually the individuals that are making the submissions, not an insurance person, not a risk manager, not a CFO. Um, so it is a very unique portal, but without the technology and the technical expertise, you can't, this can't be successful. So. 
I think we are going to have continue to have even a greater advantage now that it's it, with new fronts, um, innovation. I think we're just going to see more and more tools that we can provide our clients that will hopefully make their lives easier. And I've been in the room before too, where, you know, companies have decided or, or are in the process of deciding, you know, Hey, look, we'd like to move uh, our clinical trial from here to there because of, you know, some strategic importance. Right. And um, you don't want those decisions to take forever either. And, and understanding this sounds like it'd be absolutely critical on, you know, for, for a lot of parts of the organization as they're considering where are we going to go next? Yes, absolutely. So there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. Christina, what inspires you? So what inspires me is really the younger generation. Like I watch my teams, almost all of the individuals on the teams are younger than me. And they inspire me every day because they are risk management professionals and they focus in a very difficult area of life science and they make it they come up with new ideas all the time and, and they are also willing to work really hard, but also wanting to take time for themselves. I have never been good at taking time for myself. So I learn a lot from them about, gosh, Christina, you're not saving the rainforest. Like you could take a breath. You're <laughs> just, you're, you know, and they show me how they can work hard and play hard. And I just learn from them all the time. And I, and I'm so invigorated because when I was their age, I just felt like I couldn't do that. If I slow down just a little bit, I'm going to lose my momentum. And they are showing me that they can be successful um, in an area that is pretty difficult and, um, and still find the time to do something for themselves and to have some more, uh, a little more balance in their life, I guess. So. Well, thank you for sharing that. And what concerns you? Uh, DE&I concerns me. Diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, I happen to be the co-founder um, of our Women's Employee Resource Group, and I'm also part of our DD&I Council. And I don't think it's a secret that women, especially women in the financial services sector, are still underrepresented quite a bit, especially in the C-suite. Um, and I have always been really passionate about paying it forward to the younger generation of women that you know, that hope that they can see strong women succeed, but without giving up so much and without having the imposter syndrome and having a support system. I always say that, you know, people would say, oh, mentors, mentors, mentors. But I always would say, no, I, I think it's more about sponsor, sponsor, sponsors. So I tell women that work with me, I always say, you should be concerned about who is talking about you when you're not in the room. And it's important to find an ally, um, especially further up the food chain in an organization that really believes in you and is willing to support you when you're not in that room. And because I just, I, it's not moving fast enough and I'm not a patient person. I'm trying to be, but I think I'm just going to continue fighting the fight. Um, but, but that is definitely an area that concerns me. So one of the, uh, one of the things that you wouldn't know about me was, um, and anybody that listens to this episode that's worked with me in the past knows this very well. Uh, so whenever I was with G General Electric, um, kind of towards the end of my career with them, I happened to, to sort of, you know, be talking to one of the, one of the individuals that, you know, was in one of these groups and. He, he had just said to me, you know, look, it's important that people at all levels in the organization are involved in this, you know, kind of for the same, for the same exact reason um, that, you know, that you're saying that, look, it's important that, you know, you, you could be somebody that's not a part of one of these inclusion groups and essentially help support those groups, you know, by sponsoring people, by making sure that their voice is heard. Um, I then, I then very much got to pay that forward whenever I went to Beckton Dickinson, um, their, um, women's group had more or less stalled, but the person that was responsible for that group was in my department. 
And so we had, we had several meetings, you know, what does it take to actually get momentum back behind this group and get things moving forward? This is important. We need to make sure that it happened. And then we actually had, you know, one of the biggest events to re kick off, you know, the, um, those sessions inside of Vecton Dickinson, uh, while I was there. And I was extremely proud at the fact that not only did the momentum and the women's group carry through for the women, it then kicked off the veterans group and the LGBTQ group and, and all the others. I mean, it just had this chain effect inside of the organization. So, um, it is absolutely critical and something to be concerned about for sure. Yeah. I love hearing that. We have several uh, different ERGs as well. And I, I just, I think, uh, I love hearing that from a man, especially too. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's great that you're an ally. That's great. Well, I was made fun of at one point. I, I, I should bring this through as well. So I, I, I was essentially there were two men standing at the front of the room saying, hey, look, we're going to make the, the women's initiative group inside of Becton Dickinson, you know, big and powerful and, you know, something that, that people can be proud of. And uh, there were two women sitting in the front, front row that were executives in the company. And uh, they had said, you know, hey, look, isn't it funny that two men are standing here? And my comment back was, look, I, I only took this on because this group had stalled. This, right. this opportunity was here for two executives as well. Um, and they, they took that challenge and then, then decided that they would, you know, help some of the other groups as well. So to me, it was kind of one of those moments where it was a bit of, you know, the executive challenge to, uh, you know, this isn't just for me. This is really, realistically, this is for everybody inside of the organization. It was great to yeah. see it move forward. So that's great to hear. You lit a fire. Yeah. So with that, Christine Varner, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I greatly appreciate you being here and uh, sharing everything with us about New Front. Great. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Thanks a lot. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast, or tell a friend about it. And last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. Thank you.